Thanks very much, and um, thank you to the organisers for uh, accepting my paper. Um, there's a buried book. In case you're wondering, I am being quite literal here. Um, in 2003, when all this was here, uh, that's me there, I excavated a paperback book from the sandy soil of the Stalag Luft III prison camp in Jagan in Silesia. Beside a brick structure, I uncovered the damp and friable remains of a small cardboard suitcase containing the, containing the powdery ruins of a shirt and a jacket, a rusty box of watercolour paints, and a German paperback book in fragments the size of fingernails. No more than three or four words um, could be made out on any one piece of the book, and it was impossible to tell beyond the language what book it was. Um, in 2012, I acquired four copies of Sarah Bodman's art book, An Exercise for Kurt Johansson, which deals with the idea of writing a book and burying the only copy in a forest. I gave two copies away to friends, I kept one of the books, and I buried the fourth copy in the park across the road from my office. Um, by now, four years on, the books probably rotted away to nothing or not very much. So my aim in this paper is to examine the m motives, the, the meanings, the context and the consequences of burying books in the ground, drawing on a few historical, literary and archaeological vignettes, um, and considering the uncanny context of the act and the fact of book burial and excavation, and bearing in mind that in burial, as in every other context, a book is never just a book. When I think about books, I have to resist the urge to use the phrase, one thing to rule them all. <laughs> but books are kind of like that. Um, at the heart of the Freudian uncanny or unheimlich are the concepts of defamiliarisation and the encounter with the concealed or lost. Um, the spatial and social lives of books are prescriptive and quite narrowly conventional. Books are most properly encountered in libraries, in bookshops, in homes, and for some of us in our workplaces. Within these spaces, they belong on sh shelves, in a row, standing on their ends. And you shouldn't stack things on top of them. Books are fundamentally indoor objects. They are, they are domesticated. Um, it's this association with the orderly, the dry, secure space of a building that makes the burial of books in cold, wet ground such a disturbing concept. Things encountered out of place and in context of death are also foundations of the uncanny. Despite this, the burial and exhumation of books is neither an uncommon phenomenon nor a new, new one. It's about as old as books. Um, according to Ibn Abbas, cousin of the your prophet Muhammad, um, evil spirits or sh shayateen are reputed to have buried books of magic under the throne of King Solomon, the prophet Solomon. After Solomon's death, the books were dug up again by demons to discredit him in the eyes of the people as a mere sorcerer. But this didn't work, as it states in the Quran, Solomon did not disbelieve, but the shayateen disbelieved. We're more familiar, maybe, with books as things which are burned, as books which are burned as censorship, as repression, as accident, from Pompeii in the Library of Alexandria to the Spanish Inquisition, the Third Reich, and so on. And the actual deliberate annihilation of libraries has been a part of genocide and ethnic cleansing through time, the Albigensian Crusade, the Chinese occupation of Tibet, and so on. Um, in recent years, the deliberate accidental or even alleged destruction of copies of the Quran has led to murders, prosecutions, lynchings and violent protests. Um, and today, the mass destruction of books as part of the publishing industry is typically carried out by pulping them, recycling the paper into cardboard and related products. People don't really bury books um, for these mundane reasons. Who does bury books then? Um, in 1995, the recently established University of Western Sydney received a donation of 40,000 books from the University of Sydney's Fisher Library. 
Uh, this was intended for the new university's library at its Campbelltown campus. At the time, University of Western Sydney was short of cash. They are always short of cash. They are still short of cash. Um, and they were suffering from a particularly severe funding deficit. So they couldn't catalogue the books. They couldn't store the books. And they looked at a number of different solutions, including selling them and pulping them. And they decided that the most economically rational decision was to bury 10,000 of the books in a hole under their campus. <laughs> Somehow, they kept this secret for about five years. Um, and um, some of the students were aware of this because occasionally books turned up in the flower beds. Um, some of them rare first editions. And these books had been damaged beyond repair. Part of the problem was that students were looking for books which were supposedly in the library but weren't. They were going actually back to the University of Sydney's official library which said, no, we donated them and so on. Um, an article in the Sydney Morning Herald used the story not unreasonably as an example of economic rationalism gone mad and said... The ghosts of 10,000 buried books haunt the university. I love that idea. Amidst criticism from students um, who compared the burial of books to um, food being discarded by supermarkets and corporations while millions of people are starving, just a little bit over the top, University of Western S Sydney officials initially said they had no other option than to bury the books. Then they apologised, called it a, quote, thoughtless act, and promised it would never happen again. <laughs> <sighs> Moving back in time, um, short life of the Protestant theologian William Chillingworth. Um, his short life included a brief, very unhappy conversion to Catholicism and um, service in the King's Army in the English Civil War. He died in captivity in Chichester in, in 1644 as a prisoner of war. In 1637, he published The Religion of Protestants, A Safe Way to Salvation, the work for which he is most widely known. Shortly before he died, he made the acquaintance of the Puritan zealot Francis Chanel, and they debated religion, um, and Chanel attended Chillingworth during his final illness, hoping to get a deathbed conversion or confession. Chillingworth, despite having been a bit back and forth about whether he, he really was a Protestant, was permitted in an Anglican funeral. Chainel attended the funeral and in front of Chillingworth's friends and relatives delivered a lengthy address in which he condemned him and his book. He said, Get thee gone then, thou cursed book, which hast seduced so many precious souls. Get thee gone, thou corrupt rotten book, earth to earth and dust to dust. Get thee gone into the place of rottenness that thou mayst rot with thy author and see corruption. Saying this, he flung a copy of, Ch of Chillingworth's, Chillingworth's book into the grave with him. Perhaps the best known example of a buried book is the bound collection of manuscript poems that Dante Gabriel R Rossetti placed in the coffin of his late wife, Lizzie Siddle, who was the model for several pre-Raphaelite painters and paintings, including Millet's Ophelia and Rossetti's Beata Beatrix. In February 1862, Siddle died of a laudanum overdose, possibly a deliberate suicide. In a grief-stricken and typically melodramatic gesture, Rossetti placed two books inside the coffin, one of them a collection of his poems in manuscript, the other Siddle's personal Bible. And um, he placed, these were placed in the coffin before Siddle was buried in Highgate Cemetery. Seven years later, in 1869, Rossetti decided that actually having sacrificed these poems to eternity, actually he'd quite like to publish them. <laughs> so he decided to exhume the book and publish the poems. And he instructed his friend and agent, Charles Augustus Howell, to, to um, arrange the exhumation, but to keep it absolutely secret. Um, Howell and a team of workmen dug up Siddle's coffin and removed the book before reburying it and replacing the gravestone. Also present at the exhumation was Dr. Llewellyn Williams, who was there to disinfect the book if necessary. Um, this is before the era of paper conservation, I imagine. By the time R R Rossetti got the book, two weeks after the exhumation, um, he found it damp, decayed, worm-eaten and stinking of disinfectant. Some of the pages were stuck together. Several of the poems, including... Jenny, which he had um, most hoped to retrieve, were badly damaged and only fragments remained legible. 
Despite Rossetti's hopes for secrecy, the story of the exhumation became public and it was quite reasonably seen as an unsavoury and disreputable act by a reprehensible piece of crap. The more you study him, the more you dislike him. Um, but this is an example of one of the manuscript pages with the um, worm damage. Um, forward in time ag- again, Ma- Ma- Max Bergström's book Treasured Memories describes the burial of family treasures and valuables in Estonia in 1944 as tens of thousands of people fled the advancing Soviet forces. And it describes as well the attempts by these people's children and descendants to recover these buried artefacts, sometimes more than half a century later. Fascinating book for those of you who don't know it, thoroughly re- recommend it. The burial of valuables in times of war, fire, danger and uncertainty is a fairly widespread phenomenon and an interesting one. And Bostrom describes the families searching for buried heirlooms, including silverware, glassware and even telephones, buried in storage um, um, vessels of various kinds in landscapes that have often been transformed beyond recognition in the intervening period. Um, other items, including guns and paramilitary uniforms, were buried for fear of implicating their owners in anti-Soviet activity. Estonian books were buried to protect them from destruction, but also as an act of cultural resistance. As he says, the books that, according to the stories, were buried were largely the sort that were forbidden by the Soviet authorities. The Soviet ban was part of a campaign to eradicate Estonian identity and nationhood. And he describes a four-volume history of the world in Estonian, bought second-hand in Italian in 1996, from a middle-aged man whose relatives had buried them in 1944 as the Soviet army advanced. And, and this was used to explain the water damage to the books and their generally de- decrepit s- state of preservation, which the current owner regarded as the scars that witness to the book's own history. So I've zoomed through some accounts of buried books here. Um, I'm interested in buried books as uncanny things and their exhumation as uncanny archaeology. And this is part of an outline, I suppose, of an uncanny archaeology of books. The burial of books, and in several cases their excavation or partial retrieval, highlight the fascination and horror with things that mimic the practices and the context of death and resurrection. Things which come back from context of death are not to be, tr- to be trusted. I've read enough good old Victorian horror to know that. Things which return from the place of the dead bring with them a stench and an aura as well as echoes of agency. Something brought them back or they brought themselves back either is bad. The motives of people who bury books range from the concealment of incriminating texts, books as buried offerings, books as waste, and books buried to condemn them. But a great deal of the burial of books, for example, through religious ritual practices, is burial of books that are understood to be more than just books, books which have in them power, books which have in them the word of God or the name of God, books which are more than just things. Another way of understanding buried books is as constituent parts of larger assemblages. Books enclosed in time capsules serve as encyclopedic or archival functions of contemporary society, and the idea of recovery and interpretation is inherent in their burial. In contrast, the books buried in wartime Estonia were buried alongside domestic and personal objects of value, but also more problematic items that could have caused their owners serious harm if discovered. But I think most interesting are the books buried with the dead. Um, here the meaning of the burial depends a great deal on the way in which the deceased was regarded. In the case of Lizzie Siddle, the loss of a loved one was mirrored in the sacrifice of treasured writings, albeit a temporary um, one. In contrast, Chainel's burial of the religion of Protestants was meant to condemn Chillingworth or to harm him in in death, the evil of the book dragging its author to hell. So in summary, the uncanny archaeology of buried books illuminates a set of practices and processes at the intersections of art, death, religion, rubbish, fear, identity and magic. In my research on on buried books, of which this is one small part, 
I've barely begun to scratch the surface of these vast topics. It's a bit overwhelming, it's exhausting, but it's so much fun. Um, that's it. Thank you.